right, so we'll get started. So, um, as you probably know by now, my name's Kelly. I'm a neuropsychologist by background, and I work in research, uh, in HD research, particularly around the psychiatric and cognitive changes that occur in HD. Uh, I am joined by Gemma. Gemma, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Gemma. I'm um, 27 and uh, from London, um, here in the UK. Um, and I am um, gene positive. Um, I tested positive uh, for HD in April last year. Um, and I inherited HD from my mum, um, who is now kind of coming towards the, the end of her life um, with the condition. Um, and I, um, yeah, uh, HD has been quite secretive in my family for quite a long, uh, quite a long time. Um, and yeah, back when my mum was uh, diagnosed when I was 14, um, we, there was so much shame and stigma in the family that we kept it a secret for quite a long time. Um, so yeah, taking part in research has been a bit of a way for me to take some of that, some of that control back. Good morning. I'm Seth, <laughs> like what do I say? Uh, based in the US, I will say I'm older than Gemma, I'm not gonna say my age, but I know Chandler, I'm still young, I know. <laughs> I get the looks all the time, but. Um, so I come from a family impacted by HD, my mom had it for 17 years, was first officially diagnosed when I was about 15 years old in high school. Um, she passed away about eight, year, well, eight years ago to the date yesterday. Um, I went through genetic testing five years after learning about it. Uh, at the age of 20, I tested positive. I'm in that, you know, uh, asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic. You may have heard it pre-manifest, I'll just say that. Uh, but really passionate about fighting back, getting more involved, and, uh, you know, being able to share my story, but also to help others, other young people who are new to the community or just trying to find that support that I wish I had uh, growing up. Uh, I'm very fortunate that uh, more recently, I've had the opportunity to work professionally at a, a company called Prolinia that's working in HD, uh, overseeing their patient advocacy and engagement. But for this talk, I am speaking on behalf of myself uh, and as uh, being an advocate and someone who has participated in uh, research. So back to you, Kelly. Okay. Uh, Okay, fantastic. Uh, so we might uh, start by talking about some key, key definitions or key terms uh, that you might hear when people are talking about research. Uh, and certainly if you have any questions about some of these key terms or you, know, you hear common um, terminology and you don't know what that means, um, please ask uh, so that you know, we can have that conversation and, and learn from each other. So the, the way that we're going to sort of split this is it's an hour long session but there's a break in between. So the first half an hour, we'll, we'll talk about Gemma and Seth's experience participating in research. Uh, and then the sort of second half of the session, we're really hoping to make it interactive. So people asking questions um, and hopefully getting some information that they need. So I think we wanted to start by just uh, explaining some of the uh, key differences between uh, observational studies and interventional trials or clinical trials. So I'm sure you've all heard those words thrown around a fair bit. Um, so, and you may know, so a clinical trial or an interventional trial is where we have two groups, at least two groups of, of uh, participants and where we're intervening in some way. So for example, we might be testing the efficacy of a drug or the safety of a drug. An observational trial, on the other hand, is when we're looking at the natural history of something and we're not intervening, we're just observing. So that's a, a really important distinction between those, those, two, um, those two kinds of studies. So for example, ENROLL is an observational natural history study. You've probably all heard of ENROLL. Uh, whereas some of the other um, trials that you might hear about being interventional is when we're testing something and so we're intervening, we're actively um, intervening with at least one group and then comparing some kind of outcome um, based on people who haven't received that intervention or, or that, um, yeah, intervention. 
Does that, so that's sort of a, a, a basic overview, but perhaps we'll throw um, to uh, Seth or, or um, and you can tell us maybe about your, um, your experience in research and, and what studies you've been involved in so far. Sure, uh, so just based off of being in that, you know, uh, pre-symptomatic stage, unfortunately I don't, fortunately, unfortunately, right, depending on how you see it, uh, I don't qualify for any of the interventional studies because I'm not clinically diagnosed, and that tends to be, for I'll say for most clinical trials, uh, is how you actually get included in, in those studies. So I've only been able to participate in observational studies, uh, such as in Rural HD, I've been doing it, I feel like, for long enough, uh, but it's, it's a great way for me to give back, and I've always wanted to do more, so I've done an exer exercise study where it was kind of like just being able to exercise a few days a week uh, because, you know, there's been some, some articles and publications on maybe exercise can help in some capacity with, you know, the, the delay of onset. Again, there's, uh, you know, I'll sp speak personally, like, I don't know if there's enough conclusive evidence in that, but I wanted to participate and kind of give back in that way. And I've done another study, observational study uh, in the US. It was called Predict HD, it then changed to Prevent. Uh, it was an uh, annual study where it's similar to enroll with these like cognitive uh, assessments. Um, who here actually has participated in an enroll? Awesome. So some of you may recall like the, the red, green, blue, yeah, that one. Very tough, uh, but you know, doing doing some of those tests, the psychiatric aspect of it, and then it was giving blood and doing lumbar punctures or, or spinal tap, uh, which I will say it sounds a lot more intimidating, but uh, it's definitely important to ask questions as a participant to kind of debunk the myths. I remember when I was going for my first one and you know telling a few people, including my family, and they're just. They're like, oh, you're flying back that same day. Like, you gotta be careful, you can't do this. You know, and then you get in your own head and you start overthinking it. And uh, luckily, <laughs> speaking to the uh, doctor who was performing it, it was just kind of like, hey, what questions do you have? Let's talk this over. You get free breakfast after. I was like, perfect, I like my eggs scrambled. <laughs> <laughs> breakfast was delicious. But, you know, I think it was good to be able to, as a participant, ask questions, right, and, and learn more. and, and be a self-advocate to say, like, what is it involved? Uh, you know, especially when you think about an intervention, interventional study, you want to be able to make sure it's in your best interest, right? Because it, it's a difficult choice. It's a time commitment. It's, uh, you know, can be very intense depending on the type of study, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the gene therapy versus a spinal tap versus even an oral pill. I think, you know, it, it's a big time commitment. And so you want to make sure it's, it's important, especially as uh, a lot of us may be full-time in school or, or working where it's, well, how many days off do I have to take? Or, you know, how long is each visit? Uh, if there's an, what's called an open label extension, is that included in the study? If, you know, and understanding that and just making sure that you feel like comfortable enough where it's, you know, a, a good choice, similar, I would say, to genetic testing, right? It's a personal choice, but, as long as you also have that support system throughout it, it's very important uh, so that whether or not the study, you know, does well or not, you have your, your support system, you have potentially a social worker or a therapist that you can rely on uh, because, again, it, it is intense. It's tough uh, to really make that commitment. But Gemma, maybe you can share about, you know, your, your uh, involvement in, in role. Yeah, so my family has been involved, um, or taking part in Enroll HD for about 10 years, um, pretty much since the first year that it sort of became Enroll. I think it used to be, was it registry before? Something like that. Anyway, yeah, first year it became Enroll. Um, and um, it kind of started off with my mum. Um, it coincided um, starting kind of just after she was diagnosed with HD. So I took her to um, Enroll appointments for I forget how many years, but a lot of years, um, uh, every year. And it was something that my mum was really, really passionate about taking part in. And from the moment that she was diagnosed, she wanted to get in research, kind of involved in research however she could. Um, and that was kind of how we ended up 
taking part as a family. Um, I have to admit that back then it wasn't <laughs> quite so much of a, a fun experience for me taking her every year because it was a, a challenge for me as a caregiver. Um, and there were certain things that, obviously the questions that come up in Enrol can be quite can be quite triggering um, for some people. And I think she used to kind of worry that she was seeing herself progress year after year. And, you know, we had to watch her doing the tests and, and realize that she was getting worse year after year as well. And that definitely came with um, challenges, but I'm really pleased we did it. And I'm pleased that mum did it. Um, and I think it gave us a lot as a family. Um, unfortunately, she can't take part anymore. I think there comes a point in, in the course of HD where, um, particularly towards the end stages, where you, you, just can't, you just can't get down to the center anymore to do it. Um, and it kind of got to the point where she um, couldn't really do any of the tests. Um, and so at that point, you know, you know it's, kind of, it's kind of game over in terms of continuing, but she was really disappointed about that. Um, I then had a, a bit of a break from Enroll. Um, the whole time that I was at risk, I actually couldn't really psych myself up to take part myself. Um, I was just trying to focus on kind of sticking my head in the sand and trying to push HD to the back of my mind um, and crack on with life. Um, obviously not push it to the back of my mind because mum was still around and I still had to care for her, but I didn't want to be reminded of my own genetics and I was kind of trying to just crack on with my life at that time. Um, and then when I tested positive um, last year, I decided to go back to enrol. And, um, and so I took part as a, um, yeah, someone who is gene positive um, for the first time uh, last year. Um, and so, yeah, I think it definitely comes with some real uh, fantastic positives, um, but it can also be, um, yeah, there's lots of emotions, as Seth said, um, taking part in any research. Um, and yeah, there's definitely quite a wide range of emotions that kind of comes along with that, I think. And just to add, I mean, you know, for me, and I thought about it more recently, like when you participate in a study, right, you, whether it's an observation or interventional, right, you, you want to, you don't know, I'll speak observational first, like going into it, you tend to overthink it because for me, I'm like, did I do better than last year? Or they ask, you know, I've been asked, well, how have you been feeling the last month? I'm like, I don't know how I'm feeling yesterday. Like, I just want to <laughs> get through the week. Like, work's been great. Or, you know, I think the challenge sometimes is, you know, things come up in life, right? Uh, whether it's work stressful or school stressful or, you know, you're having a really great day or week and and it's tough to then you know realize I'm like well if I say this are they gonna think it differently or is it am I saying the right thing and so you know part of me is like how do I how can I make sure that I'm not just answering best for them but also best for me so it's not just like a an outlier right of like well you know this week was just bad but that shouldn't be the case of now they're writing it down to say oh he, he had a bad week right uh, and for interventional right if it's a, a blinded or double blinded study um, and has placebo, you don't know if you're going to have the drug or not. So you don't know if it's working. You don't know, you know, it, how that might impact you and how that might impact others. But I, I say all that just because it, it is very important to like, you know, have that mental health support uh, because studies are, are again, co very big commitment. And I think a lot of times, and I've learned from some of my uh, friends who have participated in studies, like, you know, it can take a toll on you mentally. And if you don't have that support, uh, you may say, well, I don't know if I can continue to do this because it's not just uh, perhaps enroll, you know, once a year. Uh, you may have heard the talk earlier, right? It's you're going in perhaps every two months or every four months or, hey, we got to do a follow-up visit that same week, right? And next thing you know, you know, it may not sound like a lot um, going in, you know, once a month, but that's 12 days. And at least I'll say in the U.S., you know, you're not always given as, as much PTO as I hear in the U.K., which is amazing. And I'm like, maybe I should move here, like <laughs> hearing about all of it. But uh, I think that's a big thing, right? 12 days of, say, PTO. And next thing you know, you only have a few days for yourself to take a break. And so I think, uh, you know, voicing your, your thoughts and trying to you know, be heard is, is important, um, especially at the site level. Um, so yeah. Um, but Kelly, 
I was just going to add, actually, um, just <laughs> just from um, what you, what particularly what you've said, Seth, is um, you know the, we give a lot of space at, at, at events like this, and, and rightfully so. But we, you know, we hear a lot about enrol. We hear a lot about some of the pharmaceutical trials that are that are taking place, the gene therapy. Um, but I guess it's really important to also be aware of smaller scale research that might be readily available in in your local area. So. Um, I come from a, uh, I've, I don't work in any of the large sort of multi-site trials. So Enrol is something that takes place at, at lots of different sites around the world. My research has always been sort of very site specific and it's been sort of um, looking at different ways of measuring uh, symptoms or changes that occur in, in HD. And, and the hope of that kind of work is to be able to then inform some of these bigger, bigger trials around what kinds of outcome measures or um, endpoints we, we might want to use. And I raise that because this is sort of smaller scale research that often takes place at one time point rather than a, a commitment such as coming in every year. And it might be more accessible for you or it might be a way that sort of introduces you to research uh, rather than making those big commitments to some of those larger studies. And, and a lot of that kind of research can take place at your local university, your local clinic, uh, local hospital. And so if you're not sure about whether you want to participate in large scale research yet, but you're interested in what ex the experience of research is, then I would encourage you to, to have a look at um, some of that smaller sort of um, scale research and, and whether that's something that could you know, help you, um, you know, test it out, put your foot in the water. The other thing I, I guess I wanted to add is you know, we have these panels and the idea is to help people understand what it might be like to participate in research and in encourage people to participate in research. But I also think it's really important that we, um, as Gemma sort of highlighted, there's, it, it can be really difficult to participate and it can be really confronting to participate. And so I think it's really important, particularly as researchers, um, to be able to hold space for the fact that we can really value research, we can be really excited about research, we can think research is really important and we can, we can want lots of research in the HD community to take place. And research can also not be right for us, and it can also not be the right time for us to participate. And that those two things can be true at the same time. It's not that if you don't feel ready to participate, it, um, that that's a, a bad thing. I, I think there needs to be space to, to feel like it's not quite the right time for you. And Kelly, just going off of research, um, you know, of course there's observational interventional, but would you say there's other, like, surveys and, and whatnot that people can do that's still considered research? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, surveys is, is a, a really good way to get started. Um, you've probably all heard Gemma plug the HDO survey that we have going on. Um, these are sort of, this is still research that really contributes um, and informs um, knowledge and, and when we talk about research, it's anything from finding a cure or a treatment for HD. It's also how do we inform the supports that we provide for people. It's also how we um, provide, you know, Seth talked about exercise trials. How do we find ways to enrich the environment? There's so many different, um, there's so many different ways that people can participate and it doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be a big commitment and it doesn't have to be a, a pharmaceutical or a drug therapy. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's really important to keep in mind. And, and all of that contributes in some way um, for certain. I, I did, um, in, when I was doing my PhD, I looked at a lot of quantitative, which is the number, so we're measuring something quantitatively, and then where, you know, you've heard of p-values perhaps, or statistical significance. But I also did a qualitative study. And, and what that means is that I asked people for their personal experience about something that had happened. And, that is still research. So, um, you know, we use people's personal experience and people's sort of words uh, as, a, as a way to understand their experience and to inform clinicians and, and other researchers. So research can look like so many different things. And, and that's why I guess I would encourage you to look at perhaps your local universities um, that have HD research. 
doesn't actually even have to be HD research, right? It, it, there's so many different things you could be involved in and just getting a bit more of an understanding of, of the breadth um, that's available. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, to what you said earlier, Kelly, about um, uh, obviously research not being right for everybody at all times, and um, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, I think probably one of the most important things to remember is that although we all love research, <laughs> that's why we're up here and that's why we're in this room, um, I think you also need to remember that your well-being is more important than any research project. And no researcher is going to want you to put your well-being um, on the line and to compromise your well-being to take part in a research project. Um, and I think that's really important to remember. So it has to be right for you. And you know, I, I, I remember there was a time, a bit of a, when I took my kind of break from Enroll, I felt like there was quite a lot of pressure from the community, like I was letting the community down by not taking part in that research at that time. Um, and actually now I've come to realize that that's not the case. You're not letting anybody down if you can't do it um, at that time. And you can always pause your participation at any time and review it at a later date and decide that you want to come back to it in a year or two years or three years or whatever it might be when you're feeling like you're in a better place. So, yeah. And that's a really good point, Gemma. I mean, we talk about, you know, what, what should you ask the researcher when you, you know, first take part and, um, or if you're involved in, in role. You know, one of the questions that's really useful to ask is what happens if I miss a session? Does it matter if I miss a session? And often, you know, you might be surprised that it, it's okay to miss a time, a time point or miss, you know, one of your annual visits if, if that uh, particular visit isn't right for you. And, and we heard that in the Ask the Expert session yesterday, this um, particularly with Enroll, it, it's okay if you miss one year, two years, and if you need to take a pause and come back in. Kelly, maybe you can explain uh, or discuss some of the misconceptions that you've heard from the community about clinical trials. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I guess I'll caution this by saying I, I don't work in any of the, the big um, the big sort of pharmaceutical trials, um, but I think one thing that I've observed, at least in the clinic, is um, perhaps the idea that when you're enrolled in one of these trials, that you're that you are that you are always going to receive a treatment. Um, and I think it's really important when people are deciding to participate in a in a pharmaceutical trial to be aware that sometimes you might receive the active drug and sometimes you might receive the placebo. And so it's not the case that participating means that you'll always um, receive a, an active drug. And I guess to second that is that the whole, that we do these trials to see, uh, we, we do these trials to see if a particular medicine or a particular therapy is going to, to work and sometimes we're not sure of the dosage. So sometimes you might be put into a, an arm of the study or a group of the study that is receiving a really low dose of the, um, of the drug and one that we might not actually expect to have a, a therapeutic effect, but we need, to, we need to be able to compare that to people who are receiving more of, 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 the, um, of the particular drug. So I think it, it, to summarize that or maybe, maybe more concisely is just to say that um, your participation is really helpful in informing uh, our therapies and informing the medicines that we're, we're trying to sort of put together, but it's not necessarily that you'll be receiving a medicine that's going to um, maybe have a, 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 an effect on your day-to-day -day experience. It's um, really important to be aware that participating in research isn't the same as receiving a treatment. Um, yeah, and just to add, I mean, I, I think something that I've heard and I've seen uh, is, you know, I know we all want, uh, we all want a treatment. We all want something that slows down HD or halt the disease in its tracks. But, you know, it's also being realistic that, you know, studies are tough. And when you're going from a small phase one or phase two, and if you're getting into a phase three, that's exciting, but there's still more work to do because now you're looking at a larger sample, right? And you. I'll continue to add the statistically significant, right? And that means that the larger the sample, the and the more effective, then it means it, it may work in a, a larger population. But 
In reality, there, you know, about 80 to 90 percent of trials fail for a variety of different reasons. Um, and I think it's understanding that not everything may work out, but that doesn't mean what you did didn't matter. Uh, and it's important to remember that is that it is still helping with research. It could help with a different indication or a different disease where they say, oh, I actually found something different. Or uh, with a different company, they were working on uh, a disease called SMA and uh, they were like, wait, this may work in HD. Unfortunately, uh, it, it didn't work out, but uh, I think it's important to see that you never know where there could be an opportunity for, uh, whether it's for HD or different condition where it, it can, and I think it's, it's uh, very important. Are we almost at time? Well, it's half past 10 now, so I wasn't sure if we wanted to perhaps. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can take a quick break. I mean, if, does everyone like to take a quick, what, 10 minute break? And then come back and what we'll do in the second half. Uh, if you came late, it's just, now it's you all come up with awesome questions to ask Gemma and Kelly and not me. <laughs> cool. So you are now free to ask questions and I will bring you the microphone. So please just raise your hand and I'll try to bring it to you soon. So anybody want to start? I'll start by asking one for Seth. Yep. Seth, um, I know you said you had a spinal tap. Um, how was it for you? Did you have any side effects? Well, that brings up a good point, something uh, we didn't discuss <laughs> before, but, uh, oh, point, I didn't mean it like that, pun intended, point, because of Spinal Tap, but that's funny now. Uh, but one of the things also is, <laughs> it's just, yeah. <laughs> one of the things, though, is uh, just understanding, like, safety, right? So we, talk, we talked about, you know, is, just in general, right, uh, interventional study, the tr is the drug, you know, effective, but it's also important to be, uh, is it safe? And also thinking about from a spinal tap, you know, there are, there, there can be side effects. Uh, you can get headaches, you can feel just tired, you might feel, you know, a, a variety of different things. And what was good was that, um, you know, the team I, I, I worked with, or I, the study team, you know, they gave me their contact information. They told me what to look out for. They gave me a paper. We went over it. They, they checked in with me. They called. They said, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling fine. Luckily for me, you know, doing it twice uh, didn't have anything. It was just, I was okay. But I do know in some cases that may not be the, uh, you know, the case for them. But yes, I was uh, on the clear. Hi, Dan Leonard from Unicure, um, and my question is around um, if trial, so a lot of trials have, <clears throat> excuse me, placebo-controlled groups, um, is how much consideration do you give to that? Does it make it a much more difficult decision if you're looking at a trial that has that placebo control? I'm all right. I, I assume you're asking about the sort of participant experience around placebo-controlled trials, is that right? Yeah, the decision-making process, when you're considering, should I do this or should I not do this, does that impact? Yeah. So I think that needs to be one of you guys. Yeah. You go first. <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the, the study. For, for me personally, I, I, I'm thinking about you know, how invasive it might be, right? Again, if it's an oral pill versus an IV versus brain surgery versus a spinal tap, right? I think I have to take that into consideration of that placebo. Uh, it also goes back to like open label extension, like will I potentially get that after, you know, as we're still trying to have the other participants uh, complete the study. So that's my personal thoughts on it is, you know, just invasiveness of it, um, the time commitment of it, and uh, like how that's going to impact my my daily living. Um, were you gonna? 
Um, when he asked, answered that, asked that question, it made me think about, well, my voice is really bad. <laughs> um, it made me think about when, um, when you get tested, you have a 50-50 chance. So I think our minds go to that. For me, it did. When I did the um, study I did, it was like you have a 50-50 chance of placebo, but in your head, it's at 50% is 100% when you don't have any other options and so it doesn't really it didn't really play a big factor I would say but it just makes you you know more desperate and more yeah <laughs> hi everybody my name is Jacosi I'm with spark therapeutics um, I'm curious for the panelists and anyone else that wants to weigh in about your experiences with informed consent. So every time you participate in, whether it's an observational or an interventional study, right, you get this raft of forms. Um, I'm interested to hear what your experience with that process has been and what could make it better. Talking about like the 25 page. Yeah, or 40, consent. or 60, or 60 right? Yeah. Written for a PhD level person, I know. usually. Yeah. Blimey, yeah, that's a big question. Um, there's a lot of forms. There is a lot of forms, and I, I guess we all are willing to do it because we're willing to take part and we're going through it as a process and we know that the end outcome is gonna be worth it. Um, but there are a lot of forms. There are a lot of forms. I'm not sure what you'd do about that. <laughs> but I feel like it's almost a bit like, you know, we were saying yesterday in the session about when you go through the genetic testing process and you feel like they're asking you the same questions again and again and again and again, um, which is important but can be a little bit annoying if you've already made your mind up about something. It's almost how I feel a little bit when I kind of take part in research. I'm like, and I definitely want to take part in this but now I have to sign loads and loads of documents to confirm that I do. Um, but it is also an important part of it. Informed consent is vital, and you guys have to cover yourselves so, as well. Um, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you do about that, but I do, yeah, it is, it's definitely something that I have kind of thought to myself, oh, you know, really again? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so I'll be honest. So, <laughs> so I actually also volunteer for um, HD Voice, the HDA. And so as part of that, I do uh, sort of um, read a lot of um, a lot of these participant information sheets that are sent to us to sort of proofread um, ahead of um, you know those kind of trials or those research projects kind of going live. Um, and so I've read a lot of them at this point. <laughs> and um, I would say. I'm getting used to skim reading them, um, but it takes some mental uh, ability and focus to sort of properly read them. And definitely in the moment, like when I'm in the room at Enroll, I'm so focused on what's ahead that I'm definitely not fully reading them in the moment. I might be more likely to read them if they're sent to me beforehand, perhaps. But in the heat of the moment, I'm just skim reading and, you know, initialing next to it. But, yeah, that is definitely, definitely a bit tricky. It was also really tricky when I used to go to enrol with my mum because at the point where she could still write, but it was difficult for her. It was really hard for her to initial all of those boxes and it ended up taking quite a long time. Um, so I think it's definitely something to think about for the future. But I don't know, you need it. You need it and we need it, but I guess it's just finding that middle ground where it makes sense to both of us, but maybe it's less repetitive, perhaps. Yeah, and I would say, uh, you know, within Roll, what's for the most part, it's the same. So, like that first time I did it, I was like, yes, I'm going to read it. But, like, the last time I went, they're like going through, and I was like, just like signing it. Because at that point, I kind of knew it was, it was the same as, as the prior year. Now that's different, of course in an interventional study and I was considering participating in one last year and what I liked about the approach was sending it to me ahead of time versus me going in and having to take 
a long time to read the whole thing. Like it, it allowed me to kind of go on my own terms of taking my time and then writing up and coming up with my questions. So then I can go back and say, okay, I read this. Here's my questions. For me personally, you know, I do look at uh, some of the specifics, such as like again, how many study visits, uh, what does it entail, um, and then you know, I, I've asked questions of like you know, how many even visits per month, but then also if there's multiple doctors uh, within that same visit, and I have to wait, say, an hour or two because of the doctor's schedule, can I get a working space to still do work? Uh, I think that's something that's uh, important, or is, it, is there an opportunity to do it after work? If it's an MRI, like, hey, can, can I go on the weekend or find a place that's at, at night uh, so it doesn't interfere with my, my working day. So these are things that I've learned about uh, more recently talking to some friends and colleagues who have participated or their kids have participated to just make sure I, I'm asking those questions. I mean, even just travel reimbursement, uh, is it, do I have to pay and then I get reimbursed? Or am I getting like a card that's gonna be there for me that's gonna cover everything? Is my parking covered? Child care, I have a dog, dog care, right? My dog's boarded right now, and he's having a better time without me. But you know, these are things that you gotta you gotta really consider. Is is what is, you know, what is involved, I guess, in that informed consent. I don't know how to shorten it as well, but uh, yeah, it's tough. Yep. I think perhaps one of the other things to keep in mind in terms of providing informed consent or perhaps even asking for informed consent is to be really clear on what the aims of the study are and, and what the goal of, of the study is. So is this study trying to understand the safety of a drug? Is this study trying to understand the dosage of a drug? Is this study trying to see a difference in some kind of clinical measure? Uh, and, and being really clear on what the aims of the study are and making sure that your motivation and your reason for participating aligns with the aim of the study. Um, because when there's a misalignment, we, we sort of um, find, you know, there's a mismatch in expectation. And so I think that's a really important part of informed consent. Thank you. And we have a comment or a question here. It's just a follow-on from your question, really, and a bit of a technicality, I suppose. Um, so I've never taken part in any studies before, but in terms of the forms that you have to fill in, are they all paper-based, or...? It depends. I think oh, okay. you know, every sponsor will approach that differently. So often they are still... Often they are still paper-based, but I think more and more attempts at moving to both digital and paper copies are being seen from what I am seeing. Um, so I don't want to speak on behalf of the entire community of folks sponsoring research, but from what I've seen, we are making attempts to move into both versions. I think that's a great question. Yeah, I think it's just in terms of what Seth said there about receiving it like, ahead of time. If you would ha could have a copy of that like on an email or on a system that you could refer back to, I don't know. It, it, I personally would prefer that because I think we're always on our phones and on our computers. Um, I just feel like I would feel more informed and, I don't know. More informed than the informed consent? Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so just to follow up, um, so I've worked as a support person for young people going through research and currently I work in training researchers and care teams in communication. And I think it's really important to really understand for that person who's thinking about entering into study, what is most important for them to know? What are they feeling? And really being able to empathize. We're not asking research coordinators to be a therapist or to, to be a psychologist, but acknowledging the real emotions and anxiety that goes into particularly a clinical intervention. You know, am I gonna get the drug? Am I not? Chris, sorry to call you out. Or am I gonna have one IV or two, <laughs> right? Is that gonna make a big deal? You know, all those things because we all, myself included as a professional, these are everyday tasks. It takes almost no muscle memory for us to rattle off those informed consents. But we're not sitting there making a huge decision about our future, about our health, about you know our risks. And so really taking the time to have those conversations. And maybe it's not word for word. I think understanding the aims 
the, the commitment, but really what are they feeling? And acknowledging that it's okay to be scared, it's okay to have anxiety, it's okay to have days that you wanna drop out of the study because you don't want another needle in your body, but really what are their expectations? How can you support them? And then what is most important for them to know? And always open that door that they can revisit those questions throughout it. Um, and so I really think making sure research coordinators and the research teams, because sometimes it's not the care team, it's a separate unit at a hospital, working with them to really understand what that means, particularly depending on where someone is symptomatically with HD. So I think there's probably a lot more training around communication and, and understanding that can also go in as they're starting to uh, launch a trial at any site. I want to know if you guys have any advice on strengthening communication between the patients going through these studies and the companies that we're doing these studies with. Um, my past experience, I feel like my family was not listened to. A couple years ago, we were in the bigger Roche trial that failed. And my dad only had one more spinal injection left when they decided to halt the study, saying that it was having more cons and pros. But from the very beginning, we were telling the doctor that we were noticing negative changes immediately. And I think they thought we were being overprotective, said it was the placebo. It very obviously was not. Because after every injection, falling multiple times within an hour, it was unusual. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. I just feel like we weren't listened to. So for to do that study for like a year and a half and for it to later come out saying that it was what we were telling the doctors the entire time, I understand. I understand that it's anonymous. Um, I understand the doctor probably should have been the messenger for us, but I do also feel like the doctors and the nurses were a little clouded because the medical company told them how successful it was, how beautiful it was, how great the results were, and so I do feel like the people we were working with was a little clouded. Um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I don't want to give up on trials, but I want a better way of communication, and I just don't really know how to go about that. It's a, a really great question, and, and thank you for sharing that experience with us and, and with the room more broadly. I, I mean, it sounds like that was a really invalidating experience um, for you and for your family and, and for your dad. Um, I'll let Seth answer the question around engagement between sort of the, the patient base and the sort of industry, but I, I suppose this comes back a little bit to our discussion just now about informed consent, um, because I think the um, one thing that's really important to know is that you can withdraw from a trial at any time. Um, so you don't have to you don't have to continue in, in trials and, and it's uh, and it, it's um, it's really important to be aware of that that if at any time you decide that it's not right for you or if at any time you change your mind you can withdraw put it on my uh, <laughs> community advocate hat uh, <laughs> just it, it's tough um, I think sometimes it's we need to remind the, the sites and doctors and everyone involved that even a simple thank you for participating can go a long way. Um, sometimes I think things get so tunnel vision that they forget that they are, these are humans, these are people. Um, and I always say if you, if just in general, if someone is creating a study that they don't, you know, as a company, right, and they don't feel comfortable participating or sending their loved one in, then it's not designed the right way. Um, and it's important to listen, like you said, and I, I don't necessarily have the answers to why you weren't listened to. Um, and I, I can imagine that can 
have a huge impact, like you said, moving forward on now deciding because you don't want to have that similar experience. Um, I don't know what what that is like, but you know, just want to say thank you for for sharing that because it's important for all of us to 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 know that and to understand that you know we need to as community members be listened to. Um, and if if you're not being listened to, where can you go? Um, I'm gonna actually hopefully lean on some of the industry folks in here and I don't know what you would do in that situation if you're trying to share information or just your experience. Is there like a general contact information email that uh, participants can reach out to? you know, any company that is sponsoring research. But what I think we can do, um, because we are in a very regulated space and there is often not an appropriate way for us to be able to engage directly. And that's really for the safety of all communities, right? That we are not putting folks in really potentially coercive or uncomfortable or unduly influencing research. And I think everything that you have shared is really important. And I think one of the things we can do is provide patient concierge services and patient support services through um, the companies that we work with to support our trials to make sure there is somebody for a family to call when they don't feel like they're being listened to in that clinical setting. So that's something that we can invest in. That's a cost, right? And so oftentimes companies are weighing in the cost of a trial overall, whether or not to provide that, but that's something companies can do. Yeah, actually that, oh, yep. Yeah. I wonder if there should be more involvement between the, the sponsor and the advocacy group, the, the people that are supporting the, the HD groups within that country or within that region, because at the moment there's uh, the advocacy groups, there are the sponsors, and then there are the PIs, but there's not enough coordination between. And I think that that's what we could get a lot stronger at. But um, there's a chap over there that I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, but he's oh. desperate to ask a question or say <laughs> something. I'm desperate to hear what he has to say. First, you and the advocacy oh. group. Um, so many things have been said. <clears throat> um, I did a clinical trial, I won't say where, but I uh, did a clinical trial for 18 months. And like all you guys like said stuff that has been like super, you said about timing, like it has to be the right time in your life. And so, um, and then you said about the cons um, um, consent form. And like, I remember during my 18 month, um, clinical trial one day, I think I had to re-sign it like three times during that 18 months, but um, one time she, um, I had a great clinical coordinator, um, and she said, oh, we're adding 25 more people to the study. And I was like, oh my God, what does that mean? What does that mean? And so of course you don't get whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, so it's like, left up to your own mind to build up whatever, you know, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? We're in phase three, they're adding 25 people. This has to be, it, it, it has to be a good thing, right? And so she was like, just sign right here. And I was like, okay, sign right there. And it's like, okay, now I'll go back to being a rat for the next eight hours. Um, and then you said, um, Y'all can quit. I mean, you don't. You can quit whenever you want to. Robin would say that to me um, every visit, and I love Robin to death. I love Robin. She's awesome. She was great. But like, you're telling that to somebody who don't want to be there to begin with. But we're doing it not because we have to, but like it has to be for the right reasons. Absolutely. Like the timing of whenever you know, um, it does have to be the right way. You can't be like, but. Uh, when it takes everything in my in my being to get there at 8 a.m., and then I'm just being reminded, oh, you can quit whenever you want to, and I'm just like, I 
can't. Like, I'm doing it for me, or I'm doing it for my nephew, because my sister is untested and had a child, or I'm doing it because my mom didn't have an opportunity to do anything before. I'm doing this because I'm trying to do something to keep my... Uh, so, like, I know you have to say that, but, like, it's just, like, I wish it didn't have to be said, like, every meeting. And Robin, that was my only thing with Robin. I was like, Robin, please do not say that to me. We had a really good mm -hmm. communication thing with me and Robin, though. So, um, <laughs> and, like, I, um, I just, I would want also to say that, like, I had gotten tested, and then I, um, I was like trying to find my place or whatever. And so then I just felt like the timing was right to do a clinical trial. And so Roche was in the works. And so this drug was supposed to like um, slow down the um, onset. And so I would look, I was remember several times like thinking while I was going through it, I was like, okay, this is supposed to buy me some time. And then Roche is, in, Roche is gonna, could come. I was like, could I be the one? Like, could, I, could this really be it? And when you're talking to somebody who has no other options, it's not like we're doing a Viagra drug and there's like 50 other Viagras to choose from. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> Only one, and Viagra of all all things. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no other options. So yes, it doesn't matter if it's 50-50. It doesn't matter if I have to rough sign all these consent forms. It doesn't matter if it's the perfect timing of my life, and it doesn't like it just. <sighs> Yeah, that's your, and that's a, those are very good points, and we appreciate it. And, and one, one thing that, uh, well, Chris had many really good points, but well, the big thing that I heard was, right, communication. You were very lucky to have that good communication with someone. Um, you had, uh, I will say, uh, you had, you had a, a great uh, social worker. Um, who might be in this room. Um, I, was, I, was, I was like guided through my whole experience, like breastfed, basically. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> but I, I think... <laughs> sure. I, I think the big thing, though, is, is, in, uh, is brought up earlier, is like a, a patient, concierge, or, you know, the support, because the support, not everyone will have the... Not everyone's going to have that support, that same support. Not everyone's going to have the friends, family, social worker, a therapist. So how do we make sure also that they have access to these resources um, that may not be affordable or may not be available to them based off of like their health insurance or, or if they don't have health insurance, right? So these are all just, I think, important um, and I'm sure could have helped uh, with some people with their experience of just having that support uh, for sure. So. Chris, I was just going to say, do you know what? You've hit the nail on the head. None of us actually, we all wish that we didn't have to be here. And um, we all wish we, we weren't in this situation. So, yeah, I, I, think we can all, I think we can all relate to what you're saying because it's true. I mean, we all wish we weren't, we, you know, we all wish that we didn't have to be up here on this panel. We all wish we didn't have to be participating in research. We all wish we weren't impacted by HD, right? And we just do the best that we can with the information that we've got at the time. But... Yeah, it's tough. So I don't have the answers, but definitely can relate to you. Um, well, we've kind of moved on a little bit now from it, but I think I'll say it anyway. Um, the thing for me, a big thing anyway, is researchers in my experience with my dad being involved in trials, it's been mainly like about the data. So like we've already had in terms of the experience and I'm not listening in terms of informed consent, it was all good that way. And then he'd kind of done the trial and it was okay. But then that was it. And there was no like checking in afterwards, how are you doing? He just kind of left and things did decrease a little bit. So he did have some side effects. So I, that was a big thing for me. It wasn't that they didn't listen doing it, but I just feel like it was just like, oh, you've done it now. Here's our data and see you later. Um, so now it's making me a little bit nervous about trials in the future, really. So I don't know about anyone else's experience. Oh, yeah, question back. Oh. No, I was just gonna say, I think someone up there also had a question at one point, I saw, maybe. But 
You can go. You're good. Thanks, Seth. Hi, I'm Anne from PTC. And I first of all want to thank everybody for any consideration they have to participate in research, whether it's um, clinical trials or surveys. Um, I know as a company and our HD study team, we fully appreciate that. So that's our commitment to your community. And I know um, Emily and I firsthand have loved ones that um, reap the benefits of those who have participated in clinical trials and now have treatment. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, my second question, or my question was, one of our commitments to all of our clinical trials that we work on is pr helping to understand and provide mental wellness along that journey of your clinical um, trial experience. And so working with either social workers or for pediatric sites, you know, child life, um, you know, what has been your experience or what can you suggest that you need in addition just to help provide those mental wellness resources? Um, great question. I, I mean, I think uh, making it, uh, for me, it's like making sure it's, it's accessible, it's available, it's not going to cost me extra. Um, you know, I, I think it's just knowing that that's, a, a, that's offered. I, I don't know how that's communicated and it, making sure it is communicated because, again, sometimes from just my own experience, it's like tunnel vision of like, oh, actually there's this thing. And it's, can you bring, you know, maybe it's also discussed uh, at the beginning versus at the end when your brain's already fried from doing all those tests and everything. And so I think it's it's crucial, but it's also just like simple check-ins from time to time are, are so important. Um, you know, it was mentioned just a second ago, it's like even just after the study, like how are you doing, right? How are you feeling? or the thank you goes such a long way or, you know, I, when I did that exercise study, I don't know the results. I asked them for the results. They didn't, I mean, I never got an email back and I think that person just ended up uh, finding another job and that's totally fine, but did, was I just another number or was I actually part of something that may have helped someone else, right? And I think that's, to me, it's just knowing like, what are those next steps? Like, did, did I do something that actually contributed in a positive way, even if the study didn't work out, at least knowing, well, here's what we found and whether it's good or bad news, just communicating that. Um, so that's me, but I don't, I mean, <laughs> kind of don't mean to put you on the spot, Chris, but I feel like you, you may have some, some thoughts. Um, go through a clinical trial and I um, I had support like literally I was aged out of HDO and like HDO like literally helped me so much like <laughs> thanks Matt <laughs> but um, it is very crucial to offer um, mental support during these visits I remember I had um, I got a notification when I was eating breakfast this morning because it's uh, uh, four days um, four years ago to the day I posted a, um, online a picture of the IV bag and like the uh, needle and I was like and I had a prayer like Lord could this be like the first um, um, drug to slow down the um, onset of Huntington's or is it placebo and uh, it just like took me back to like I had. Chandler, I had um, Seth, I had a support group, I had Dr. Anderson, I had Robin who was great. I had like a great support group and I still struggled mentally. I had a great therapist I saw at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays, every Tuesday. And I, um, I, still, I just can't imagine what people who don't have a support group like that can go through a trial because you get nothing back, you get no information back. It's just you give, you give, you give, your lab rat, your lab rat, you signed up for it, so it's, you know, you know what you're getting into, and then still you give and you give, and then they don't offer, they can't afford to have a patient advocate and I to this day believe from now on if like a company does not cannot afford to offer mental support or a therapist of some type or um, social worker of some type 
like on site during the visit, then they should not be allowed to come into our community and um, ask for our bodies and our time and our mental space and our our uh, vulnerability and just to um, and then just to tell us on a call, trust me guys, we want this just as bad as you do. Seriously, CEO of a company, there should definitely be some something in between the CEO and um, 200 people on the call after the third trial, um, third phase, and we haven't heard from them since April and it's June now, and they're doing a um, call, and the CEO says, well, trust me, guys, we want this just as bad as you do. And I could have, during the middle of COVID, this shut down, and people were like going through. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I want to be mindful of everyone's time, and I know we're a few minutes over. Um, I won't speak for them, but I'm happy to stay, to stay uh, or walk or chat during lunch. But I think uh, you know a few just quick takeaways uh, from this is for me it's also just understanding from the sites I, I, I've in a prior company I worked at. You know I've learned a lot about the challenges with sites because you want to go to the best, right? The best of the best uh, doctors and sites, but now suddenly they're working on. 10, 15, 20 different studies, and they're just trying to get everything staying on time or trying to find, you know, help support it. So that's the other, I think, possible challenge that might be faced is they're just so, again, tunnel vision of like, I need to get this done, I need to stay on track. Oh crap, I forgot about that. And that's where that mental health support uh, services could, could come in. And, you know, the other part is when people participate, they, it's tough because from a, you know, for, for companies, they don't want, especially if it's blinded, right? It's it's a risk. They don't. They can't know these things, as as mentioned. But people want to share because they want to feel like I'm doing something to support my community, or I'm just doing something. I want to share something, or just talk to someone about it. And so I don't have the answer of how to improve that. But if there is some way, uh, you know, where you know companies and including one I'm at, like just to figure out how to make them feel a part of it versus, like you said, a number or, you know, quoting you, a, a lab rat. Uh, I think it's, you know, we need to figure that out. We need to do better uh, to communicate that to then also say, like, you know, it, it, you are helping make a difference. Not necessarily saying, like, we're in it. They, I think it's, people are very passionate but it's understanding that it's a different, I guess I would say personally, a different type of passion than perhaps a participant's passion. They still want to do it. They still, I mean, I, I would say everyone, everyone in this room wants a treatment. Um, you know, I know companies are rooting on each other, right? Uh, because they want to help the community. People are passionate. They're in this, to, hopefully, to, to make a difference. But it, it does come down to how do you make sure that you know, you're not just pas passionate, but you're also listening to the community and then implementing their feedback into future studies. So thank you all for, for joining us. We truly appreciate it. Thank you uh, to these two amazing uh, co-panelists, or it's not co, what's, a, what's for three? Tri-panelists? Tri uh, yep, yeah, all right, lunchtime, lunchtime. <laughs>